Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you at uh, the monthly seminar of E3+. I have the task from uh, the chairman, chairwoman of the seminar, Manjit, to introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker for this uh, evening. Uh, Professor Felipe Calvo, that I wanted to thank for, uh, for the time and uh, the kindness to present uh, his activities. Uh, Professor Calvo is a clinical oncologist that uh, initiated his medical career at the Autonomous University of Madrid and complemented his uh, education at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and uh, at the Department of Radiation Oncology and Nuclear Medicine in Alemann University in Philadelphia. He started uh, his uh, professorship as full professor in the Department of the same University in Philadelphia. And then in 2007, became Chair Professor of Oncology at the Universidad Complutense Madrid. In 2018, uh, he accepted the position of director of Proton Therapy Unit at the Clinica Universitat de Navarra, installed in the Madrid campus. He is member of ESTRO, where uh, he won also awards, sure an award in 2011 and Lifetime Achievement, Achievement Award in 2020, member of AOTC, and uh, he has been uh, founder and director of the Spanish School of Radiation Oncology. He has a scientific production of more than 400 publications and also very important for us, is member of the external scientific advisory board of our project E3+. So it's with great pleasure that I ask Professor Calvo to give his seminar to us. Thanks a lot. Thank you to you, uh, Sandro, Mr. Uh, Rossi. Uh, it, it, this, is a, this is a great opportunity for me and I'm very grateful to be able to, to interact with all of you. I see a large audience. I see the names of some of my colleagues, physicists and, uh, and doctors as well. We disseminated this information among, among uh, people around us. And uh, for those of you that I don't know you uh, personally, let me just say that uh, what I'm going to do is to think as a clinician, think as a clinician uh, in the world um, of um, particle therapy. Most of the data that I'm going to discuss and I'm going to, uh, to show to you is uh, coming from, uh, from proton therapy, which is uh, uh, the data that we have available more abundant. And um, this is something that I want to mention at the beginning, you know, I really want to, uh, to center the presentation in what do we, the physicians and the clinicians think about the present and future of particle therapy based on proton data? What is the health value that we can uh, uh, discriminate today? And what are the opportunities that we have in front of us? I'm going to share the slides, but I need someone to tell me that you are able to see the slides. Are you? Yes. Uh, please, in, okay. Now it's, it's okay. In the yes. presentation mode. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, this is, a, a, um, this is, this is thinking. This is arguments. This is uh, see, looking at the data and trying to understand from the point of view of a, of a practitioner, what is possible today to think about the implementation of particle therapy in cancer treatment and what will be possible in the very near future. Today, oncology and cancer medicine is a, a, a cycle like this is patient-centered precision medicine, is personalized oncology, and is your tumor. 
When I was trained 40 years ago, this was not this way. Tumors were the protagonist. You have to understand the tumors and you can not forget the patient, but almost, you know. Uh, today we are we have going through the cycle and we are very, very much trying to understand how to use better our treatments and our diagnosis for every single patient because every single tumor is probably different from, um, from another patient. Radiotherapy is, um, has grown and has developed um, to a level of, um, of, of excellence very high. I started my training with cobalt units. I um, now I'm working with protons. You know, this is a real dream technologically from, for, a, for an oncologist to be able to do all that transition. But what is important is that for the patient has been very good. For the patient and for the cancer treatment and cancer cure, radiotherapy has been able to introduce ways to be conservative with organs and functions, has been able to uh, dance well with all systemic therapy that you can imagine, with immunotherapy, with chemotherapy, with any therapy, drug therapy, dance very nice with, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, radiotherapy. And in those countries in which it is accessible to the patients, is very um, is used uh, in a very high rate. More than six to seventy percent of patients along the treatment of their cancer are going to receive a component of radiotherapy. Sometimes for cure, sometimes for palliation. Sometimes not knowing whether it's for cure or for palliation. Like uh, today, we have the the horizon of, uh, of oligometastatic disease, which is an ambiguous situation in which we are not sure whether we're using radiation for cure or for palliation. A percentage of patients will be cured. I bring you this slide to show Europe and to show that in those countries in which uh, radiotherapy is accessible, they, they have good technology and good, uh, and good management in healthcare, the, uh, the uh, in increment of, of radiotherapy use um, expected for the coming years is around 20 to 25%, an, an amazing increment. And this is uh, also true, has been uh, reported by the uh, North American colleagues. They are expecting for, for 2050, an increment of 30% of indications of radiotherapy in cancer patients. Yes with the present knowledge and, and, and practice. As you uh, well know, because you are in the, in the area, protons are growing fast in terms of uh, installations and availability, and uh, heavy ions is growing not that fast, but it's growing, and, uh, and it's expected that it will grow, uh, uh, and, and, and protons will help to open the door um, for the use of heavy, uh, of heavy uh, ions as well in, in cancer treatment. Again, as a thinker, as some as a practitioner, mm -hmm. I want to share with you these two, um, the maximum. Uh, this is, um, uh, the, the first one is coming from one of my professors. Professor Giulio Danjo was the, the founder of pediatric radiotherapy in the United States. Most of the trials uh, with components of radiotherapy in pediatric oncology uh, were developed by him, the doses, the fractionations, and so on. Um, he uh, started to see patients coming back from treatment with um, very important toxicities and very handicapped. So he wrote that, um, that editorial in cancer. At that time, cancer was a, the, the journal for oncologists. Uh, the, the editorial was cure is not enough. And this was like an insult for many uh, radiation oncologists because at that time cure was enough. And uh, I was trained uh, with that mentality, you know, cure is enough and then you have to pay a price for it. And, uh, but he was a visioner. He, uh, he, he, he stated that very clearly, you know, for kids, for pediatric patients, we have to do it in, in, a, in a tolerable way. Uh, it doesn't make uh, many sense that we have so, so um, toxic patients and some toxic human beings long-term follow-up. And the second uh, image is uh, personalized. Personalized, 
is personalized. If you want to, if you want to be the doctor of that little girl, you better be uh, very nice to to the um, to the muñeca, and, and you better you know better you, know, you better treat the 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 context of the human being, and then you will be a, a believable doctor. One point, short point on 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 protons versus uh, versus um, heavy ions and, and practic. I know it's they are different. I have no personal experience with heavy ions, but what I would like to share with you are, are the arguments of protons, which are the door probably to expand uh, the use of particles in medicine. We are now working in Madrid under this type of uh, of structure. We have a hospital and in the corner of a hospital, an academic hospital, a university hospital, we have a synchrotron and that synchrotron has a gantry and the gantry goes to a treatment room and the patient get treated by the, uh, by the beams that we are able to generate. What is, uh, what is uh, unique of, of our uh, setting is that we are using a synchrotron in Europe from, from uh, Japanese technology, and that we are using a, a, a 360 degrees uh, commercial, 360 degrees um, uh, gantry to treat the patients. Altogether, this has proven to be quite robust and uh, and quite quite um, uh, uh, active in 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 guiding the the clinical practice in in the real patients. This uh, slide is one of the most important ones I want to show it to you. This is what I think today. I think today that proton therapy and particle therapy is bringing to oncologists and to clinicians a new science in which we have to be much more meticulous and much more interested prospectively, which is the science of normal tissues the science of the tolerance of normal tissues. We are not with particle therapy today. The difference is the normal tissues, to, the normal tissue toxicity or tolerance, the way you want to put it. The difference uh, up to now is not so clear about the tumor control, but it's very clear about normal tissue toxicity. We have the, uh, uh, we are lucky to have the BRAC peak and we are lucky to protect the uh, fragile normal tissues. This is the way we do it. This is a good uh, cartoon to, make, to explain to other people why the Black Peak is so attractive, because we can't really protect a lot of fragile normal tissues in, in our patients. And this is just to make, uh, you all know these this, uh, this, uh, figures, but let me make my points on these figures. When I was a resident and I treated patients with brain tumors, I put a cobalt field there and a cobalt field there, and I, nobody cared, not myself, anybody cared about the, the exit of the beam in that particular patient. 30 years after, we have improved amazingly on precision. We are able to really treat the target uh, uh, very accurately, but we probably have um, not improve in the protection of, no, of normal tissues. We probably have even uh, done n not, not such a great job on uh, unnecessary radiation to normal tissues. Protons, of course, both passive and pencil beam are able to uh, protect very nicely normal tissues uh, around the target in the brain is very evident, but in other, in, in other sites, in the body, in sites, in the body is uh, as evident as in the brain. Here you have the um, kind of spinal irradiation model, which is amazing for, for, for us as clinicians that you can protect the thyroid, the breast, the, uh, the blood, the, uh, all the um, microbiota of the, of the um, intestine. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a complete different biology. We, we, are, we are dealing with, um, with patients and we are treating patients in a completely different biology. This is in colors, but in colors you understand that even the best, the best technologically um, appreciated um, treatment for craniospinal irradiation from the point of view, like tomotherapy, from the point of view of unnecessary irradiation is the worst. 
So these are these are um, these are um, uh, situations that we have to 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 rethink and to assume that we we have to change. You probably know some of you, at least the the, the uh, clinicians. You probably know Jim Cox. Jim Cox was one of the of the um, in, uh, founders of proton therapy in uh, in MD Anderson. And when once he was asked so many times why you uh, you don't do a randomized trials with protons, and uh, and 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 he he decided to write an editorial to make it very clear, you know, who wants to receive twenty five grays unnecessary in any normal tissue. So this is the point, you know that. It's clear we have to do it in, in the in the way we have to do it today. We have to do it with the present technology, but building up the future, the argument is that unnecessary radiation is unnecessary, and it's something that we have to fight for ourselves and for our patients. A cancer patient is not the best human model to deliver unnecessary radiation. They are they are sick enough and they have problems enough to be as, uh, as protective as possible. The dilemma for the young people is whether you are in evidence or you are in innovation. In general, in life, you tend to, to go to innovation because evidence uh, brings to you the, um, the um, uh, inevitably the limits of knowledge. And when, once you see the limit of knowledge, you say, you think, well, let's change, let's, let's move to another, to, to another field and let's improve. But evidence is published, is published uh, data, and published data with protons has this problem. This is a, this are, this is a great article from the MD Anderson people and some of the North American people in which they try to show to other scientists, other clinicians, other physicists, other oncologists, that with technology, you need the time. You need the time to mature. You cannot be product, uh, producing papers uh, six months after the installation and starting treatment. You need a lot of time, a lot of time, and you have to be patient. And, and this is part of the bad reputation of, uh, of, uh, of proton therapy and in general technology, new technology, is that it, this is not like a drug. This is not an effect that you can measure in months. This is an effect that you are going to measure in years. So it, it takes a lot of time to, to build up the, um, in the, the, the data. And the same article going by sites, gastrointestinal, CNS, prostate, lung, and so on, published, reported, going by years. Here is MD Anderson starting. Uh, 2007 is when they started to treat, uh, to treat patients and they have been very productive afterwards. And most of the data that we have, clinical data, well analyzed and well published, in available is coming from uh, MD Anderson and, 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 Mass, Gen and Mass General and, and, and uh, Mayo Clinic. I know that Europeans are going to get a little bit uh, um, um, unhappy with this, but the reality is that we as clinicians, we, are, we don't have the, pro the productivity that is possible to, uh, to actually analyze in the literature uh, coming from, uh, from the States. And why not? Well, I'm, I'm not going to make points on, on heavy ions, well, because the data that is reported is, is very scarce and, uh, and it's not that easy to, uh, to, um, to make an argument and to, and to um, um, explain uh, properly. Now I'm going to touch an area in which I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in health uh, value, in uh, health care, in, um, um, in economics, in health economics. And I'm not an expert because I have been able to live in different countries, in different uh, contexts. And I know that each country, each place has its, its own uh, system. And its own system is, is, um, cannot be exported properly in terms of metrics. You know, international metrics in healthcare cost are heterogeneous, extremely heterogeneous, and that is a point that will make uh, very difficult to to uh, 
to to homogenize the, the knowledge and to and to help to, to grow arguments, solid arguments for the expansion of total theory. ESMO and ASCO, which are uh, societies based on the on the uh, on the treatment with drugs mostly of uh, cancer patients, they agree in in a certain level of uh, of definition of clinical benefit. Uh, and the clinical benefit definition comes mostly from less toxicity. Now the drugs also are used looking at normal tissues and good tolerance. Technology has always looked at that. We have, uh, we have the correlation between dosimetric benefit and clinical benefit for us is very uh, straightforward. We will not expect a clinical benefit from radiotherapy if there is not a real benefit in dosimetry. Dosimetry is the door to get into the clinical benefit. And uh, uh, the reviews of, uh, as far as 2016, uh, about the cost and cost effectiveness of proton therapy, these are reviews based on, on really abstract and, and very few uh, papers with very different methodologies, with different countries and different financial um, uh, um, spirits. So at the end, if you look at the list of conclusions, well, they see some cost effectiveness in prostate cancer coming from the Japanese data. data cost-effective as in pediatric tumors coming from non-randomized trials, non-randomized trials. Breast cancer is a model for left-sided cancer and is a speculation. Has not, it is based on the symmetric recreation, but not in real follow-up of patients. Non-small cell cancer, uh, lung cancer, local regionally advanced, head and neck, and so on. So the point here is, yes, we have papers that are reviewing uh, and interested in, 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 in making arguments for cost effectiveness, but uh, they are, again, heterogeneous, not only in the financial metrics of the analysis, but also in the um, type of diseases uh, that, that, that are mentioned and the, and the context of the, uh, of the countries in which the data has been developed. But nevertheless, let's, let's see at uh, uh, the nice data that has been uh, uh, reported recently. Let's, let's, let, let me make a point on health value of protons in oncology. In oncology, we have today a great advance in general with more, more and more patients being cured. I will show you uh, in, the, in, in the final part of my talk the, uh, the, how the survivors are growing in the States. Cancer survivors um, figures are growing in the States. So if we accept that there is more and more cure because of early diagnosis and better treatment and so on, the uh, important, uh, the, in, one of the important arguments is uh, better quality of cure. It's not cure only, it's better quality of cure. We need the patients to be as, 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 uh, as, as good as possible. In the NCCN, uh, in the NCCN um, guidelines, which is an effort made mainly by a North American um, uh, oncologist, the categories um, that uh, are linked to recommendations in the level of, of importance are uh, based uh, theoretically on randomized trials. Well, this is not true. Randomized trials, they only exit, exist um, abundantly on drugs, treating with drugs. Randomized trials with technology are very difficult to develop. If not, probably not the best model to develop um, uh, knowledge. So most of the NCCN data altogether, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, systemic therapy, and so on, is coming from expert recommendations. It's not coming from randomized trial. That is a wrong uh, judgment that is very uh, uh, expanded ar 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 along the world. Health value 
in radiotherapy. I mentioned that the health value in radiotherapy is based on dosimetry. Uh, one of the, the important step forward is uh, be, uh, dosimetric benefit. Let's look at pediatric oncology. In pediatric oncology, today in prosperous countries, we don't discuss uh, the components of radiotherapy in pediatric patients. We don't do that because we have a lot of data already reported and well reported. This is New England uh, Journal of Medicine with more than 3,000 siblings in the United States, one with cancer, the other without cancer, follow for many years. And you see that the, uh, the person that uh, was a survivor many years after, if they was treated early on with a cancer was extremely toxic. More than 70% of the patients will need supportive care and we have a level of dependence, social dependence for treatment. And part of it was because of radiotherapy, probably not of it, not all of it. And systemic therapy contributes to, to that as well. But uh, yes, we have to assume that uh, um, uh, long-term toxicity from radiotherapy in pediatric patients are very, is very damaging uh, for the survivors. Now I want to show you three results that are really um, special in pediatric population. One is neurocognition, look at this. This is um, a, a comparison, retrospective, methodologically questionable, but is the, the one we have of cranospinal irradiation, uh, difference in neurocognitive function from Canadian kids and North American kids. Canadian kids were treated with, uh, with uh, photons and the North American, they belong to proton therapy uh, institutions. And there was a significant difference in many, many of the, of, the, uh, of the parameters, functional parameters that were analyzed. This is a complete surprise because the, um, the, um, the, uh, in a kind of spinal irradiation, the difference is made in the boost of the posterior fossa. The rest of the, of the, of the, uh, of the system, uh, of the um, uh, uh, neural tissue is treated in both. But look at this, you know, there is a difference in, uh, in global IQ, in memory, and in reasoning, and that uh, difference is sustained in, the, in, 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 in time, or even, in, even improves a little bit in time in the population with protons. This is one of my patients, I asked, the father is a doctor, the mother is a nurse, was treated with uh, craniospinal irradiation, she's back in Ecuador, and I asked his father to send me the scores in the school every trimester. And uh, the last trimester was terrific. She has a 10, a 10, a 9, a 10, a 10, and a 10. Hopefully that she does well uh, very long term. Hematological intolerance in, uh, again, pediatric patients, and again, the craniospinal irradiation uh, model. Uh, in craniospinal irradiation model, the amount of blood, not bone marrow, blood, circulating blood that you unnecessarily irradiate with photons is very high. And you can see that, yes, when you compare protons and photons, uh, there, are, there is a, a significant difference in, uh, in, in leukopenia in all the components of the blood, lymphopenia, leukopenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia. So uh, again, a model that is showing that the effect of unnecessary irradiation can be measured and, and, and will be important. Why important? Because in lymphocytes, in lymphopenia, is all our immune competence. And if we have patients lymphopenic, we have patients with less capability to defend themselves and to be able to cure the disease by his own immune um, reaction. And finally, a well-known topic, which is radio-induced cancer. Radio-induced cancer in proton and particle therapy. These are more than 400 uh, Japanese patients follow um, long-term, up to 10, uh, 20 years after treatment. They were able to 
see that no malignant secondary tumor occur in the, within in the in the irradiated field. These were 400, more than 400, treated with particles. Not a single radio induced in the field of high dose radiation therapy. If you look to the opposite model, which is IMRT, photon IMRT, you see that you have a peak of, second, of, of radio induced or radio related uh, tumors in the volume with, with doses as, 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 as low as 2.5 grays. So really the night and the day, you know, a difference in, in terms of uh, protection from secondary re uh, radiation related tumors very high. This makes that in today, today there is an agreement uh, um, uh, that uh, patients, pediatric patients should be, um, should be referred to proton therapy uh, centers if possible uh, all over the, whenever it is possible to do. If you look at the large international um, base on clinical trials, clinical trials go proton therapy. There is uh, there are uh, certain pediatric um, uh, trials and, and, and clinical uh, registries. None of them are uh, randomized. They all are observational. In adult ca um, uh, cancer models, I want to make a point in toxicity. I call it costicity, the cost of toxicity. The, in, the, uh, in the academic literature is called financial toxicity. I think costicity is probably better, a better term. And, uh, and what, is, uh, what we, we think is a, a, is a point of value for uh, protons and particle therapy to be exploited in the future. Value is a relationship between positive outcomes and costs. And if you analyze these two elements, you can create a level of understanding of the value of a certain technique. This is an example, a very uh, luminous example from MD Anderson. Patients with head and neck tumors treated with intensive chemo radiation, intensive chemo radiation. And you see that the cost of treatment with protons is higher at the beginning because the cost of the fraction of protons is higher than the cost of the fraction of IMRT photons. And this is true until toxicity. When it reaches to toxicity, to severe toxicity, and you have to do replanning, feeding tubes, uh, emergency room, uh, hydration, uh, antibiotics, and all these supportive measurements, then the cost uh, um, uh, gets almost similar. And because the, pro the, the proton patients, they recover better and early from toxicity, the cost in the, median, in the intermediate follow-up is higher for photons than for, for, for protons. This is a, a, a very, um, very illust illustrative kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of um, argument in, in, a, in a selected group of patients, which are head and neck patients. They have put, they have given, uh, recently they have reported again in the Anderson and the, the senior author is Steve Frank. Um, they have reported with data, with North American data, with dollars, uh, what, what happens with these uh, cohorts of patients. And uh, they, they can uh, uh, identify a subset of IMRT patients that have similar cost of or even superior cost, cost, to, cost um, than in, um, um, proton therapy patients. In particular, they think that patients that are extremely fragile, the very old patients, the very uh, comorbid patients, the ones who have pluripathology, those patients need to be treated with the less uh, toxic system uh, uh, with radiation. And also they did a review, it's the same group, it's uh, Steve Frank again with his people, they did a review of the literature. And in the literature, what he found is four papers uh, from four different countries with four different approaches, with four different um, uh, coins and, and financial um, 
uh, analysis. So very difficult to make a point that the um, that uh, cost effective analysis for protons today, protons versus photons, is um, is, uh, is is valid at the, at this time. Now, a different topic, a different topic, which is the topic I like as a clinician. This is a great contribution from in the University of Pennsylvania, in which they put together patients, thousands of patients, 1,500 patients, treated at the same time with chemo radiation, intensive chemo radiation, photons or protons, more with photons because of the coverage of the, uh, of the insurance company, less with protons, and they compare toxicity and complications. Toxicity, they look for toxicity three or more, grade three or more. That is a believable data because grade three or, or more needs management, and management means that the, you write in the chart with the maneuver that you do, the recommendation, the, the drugs that you're giving to the patient. And look, look what happened to them. Uh, it's, a, it's, a combination of, um, it's a combination of models. It's head and neck, pancreas, lung, esophagus. And this group of chemo radiation patients, intensive chemo radiation patients, they were not able to show any um, any effect, deleterious effect on, on survival, but it was a tremendous effect on prevention, protection, less uh, grade three toxicity in the proton group uh, of, pro of chemo radiation. It moved grade three, four toxicity with protons 11%, 27% with photons. And not only was the, um, the acute toxicity, but also the, um, in the duration of the toxicity and also in those patients with, uh, who had uh, um, uh, admission to the hospital because of, of uh, operations, program operations and so on, the uh, long-term uh, stay in the hospital was significantly different, less for proton therapy patients than for photon therapy patients. But from the point of view of a clinician, why? Why such a difference? Why such a difference? What is happening in reality is that the area of the tumor, the target is receiving a very high dose and the patient is receiving chemotherapy. So the difference in terms of the biology of the toxicity is the unnecessary irradiation, low and intermediate doses in normal tissues is the only explanation for such a difference. And it can, it, 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 it has to be, it's like a systemic effect. It has to be through the blood, through the lymphocytes, through, because it doesn't go through the skin or the mucosa. It goes through a different type of effect that we have to think more about uh, in the future. We have a great model from MD Anderson uh, that mixed mix um, uh, benefit in causticity and survival. And that model is, uh, is esophageal cancer. They have treated and analyzed uh, many times and reported many times their experience with esophageal uh, cancer. Esophageal cancer needs in general chemo radiation uh, and a surgical uh, time if possible, if not chemo radiation radically. And the way to deliver protons is very protective to the heart and to the many other um, structures. In the case of uh, IMRT or BMAT, you expose to low or intermediate doses of radiation therapy, much more, nor much more normal tissues and more circulating blood. Here you have the effect on the heart. Uh, here you have the effect, the non-effect of protection from, uh, from uh, IMRT photons or, uh, or BMAT. They first analyze the immediate, um, uh, the immediate feature that we're able to, uh, to uh, analyze in this uh, cohort of patients, which was the, uh, the hospital stay after the surgery. And the hospital stay after surgery with 3D radiotherapy, IMRT radiotherapy, or 
proton beam radiotherapy was very different and very, very much uh, significant. This means a lot of uh, money, a lot of health um, value um, addition, and a lot of suffering as well. We have data from a randomized trial, first randomized trial that has been reported from the intergroup in the States, deals with esophageal cancer proton versus photons with chemo radiation and an opportunity of surgery if the patient is a candidate. And the first report is extremely um, um, different in terms of toxicity and complications. Two, uh, two times more toxicity from photons than protons in what they call total toxicity burden, 11 events, and seven times more um, uh, uh, severe complications in patients who, who, need, who were treated with surgery as well. So, you know, this is uh, the difference was not what, what did not affect to survival, but difference in, term, in, term, in terms of health value is, um, is clear enough for, uh, for, for patients, uh, proton and photons uh, in the chemo radiation model of esophageal cancer, localized esophageal cancer. The group of MD Anderson, they, their own group, not the intergroup, they own, their own group, their institutional group, they see a difference they see a difference in survival. And this has been reported in favor of proton beam compared to intensity modulated uh, photons. And the explanation, now look at me for a second. This, how can you, with the same tumors, apparently, with the same chemotherapy, the same radiotherapy, the same um, institution, the same, um, post-operative care, surgeons, and so on, have a, have a difference in survival, which is a systemic effect from local regional uh, treatments. Well, they are convinced that it's coming from lymphopenia. Lymphopenia is an effect that is seen much more frequently in photons than in protons, and in photons, that frequency is not only more, but, but more uh, severe. Probably those patients have a problem, a real problem in self-defense, in, auto, in, in, in autoimmunity. And when they look at the data on how many patients achieve a complete remission from chemo radiation in the esophageal tumor, in the primary tumor, you see that the ones who are able to achieve a complete remissions are those patients that have enough lymphocytes to help the anti-cancer effect of chemo radiation with their own immunity. Twice the level of, of PT zeros of, of, of complete responses if the patient uh, in the cohort of patients without a lymph severe lymphopenia. A final slide um, in, in the clinic, in adults, in clinical um, uh, assessment of uh, cost, uh, comparing um, uh, protons and photons and stereotactic body and so on. And this is coming from Japan. And at least in Japan, with quite a lot of patients being treated, uh, they see that the proton group uh, has some value, added value, to, um, to uh, health, um, um, uh, health fu functionality, in particular those who are young. Lower risk of uh, urinary toxicity, less dysfunction, uh, erectile dysfunction, and less risk to, um, to bowel toxicity. What is the reality today? The reality today for protons in the, in the clinical scenario is that uh, we follow recommendations from, this, uh, from the international societies, from the scientific societies. Astro has a, a good um, a website in which you can find the, what they call the um, medical necessity indications of proton therapy, and you can find also uh, um, another another um, recommend level of recommendation, which is coverage with evidence development, which means that yes, 
we will pay for your proton therapy treatment if you um, uh, agree to participate in a clinical trial that is going to generate knowledge and is going to, to, um, to help. So we follow that and we have a list of diseases. Uh, in the case of the Japanese that they have a very long culture of using particles in cancer treatment, the list is amazing. It's more than um, uh, 35 sites, histologies and stages. Most of the recommendations they have, this list I'm showing you is in Google. If you put Google Astro protons, you will find them. They are recommended, recommended as an, as an alternative to be treated with different tumor sites and of course, all the pediatric patients. In Spain, at Clinica Universidad de Navarra in my center, what do we, we do? Well, we try to follow recommendations from our national society, the international society, the Minister of Health, but we were training in, 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 at Mayo Clinic. So we know that those are recommendations that are in the list, but the patients can be informed that they have alternatives and they have dosimetric alternatives that in some cases are dosimetrically very different, different enough to be considered as the optimal treatment, as the best possible alternative for you and your tumor. Let me show you one day when I was uh, uh, training in at Mayo Clinic, I did this slide with my own iPhone. This, uh, this was uh, a computer from a nurse. And that day, which was the 5th of August of 2019, she showed me this, uh, this, uh, this uh, screen. And it's patients being treated in the proton therapy center at Mayo Rochester, the different disease sites that they are treated, treating, the different uh, uh, number of patients that they were treating. It's, it, it was a monument to transparency, to institutional transparency, but it's a monument also to the use of protons in a liberal way, in an open way. If it is a better uh, dosimetric option, we offer the patient that. And if the patient can, um, is interested, we can do that. Important uh, in the mind of doctors, uh, as, soon as, uh, as, uh, uh, as much as we get uh, old and older, we, we, uh, we try to learn the other lessons that are not based patient to patient, but are society lessons. And the society lesson I want to share with you in this, at this moment is that in Europe and in Spain, we have a very important demographic change, which is a social change, which is going to, um, to impact very heavily on uh, healthcare, health value arguments and so on. The, the, in the same way, we are not discussing proton to protons uh, to, um, to pediatric patients. In a very similar type of arguments, we are not going to discuss in the near future proton therapy to old, very old, very fragile, very comorbid patients. Because those tissues are not normal, they are very abnormal, and they need as, as much protection as possible from the component of radiotherapy if they are going to survive longer. This is what happened in the States. This is a, a, another social change, another demographic change, medical demographic change, which was unexpected to me when I was a young resident. I need, never thought about this, that we, we were going to accumulate so many long-term surviving patients from, um, from cancer, many of them treated with radiotherapy, many of them needing new radiotherapy and putting into the table the issue of ray radiation. So this is a, another thing that is changing. And if you look at the survivors long-term, in total, more women than men are alive very long-term and women will develop other type of, 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 of cancer as well in this type of cohort. Opportunities for practice, 
Re irradiation is a reality, is not in the list of many of the uh, societies, but it's uh, something that is uh, a real demand. This is a patient with a, with a recurrent tumor in the area not previously irradiated. Here you have atrophia and, and not, um, uh, and, and, and there is a little bit of um, here. And after being treated, you can see that the tolerance was nice and the remission was nice. And we were able to uh, concentrate the dose into the area and to avoid uh, large areas of tissues previously irradiated, which was not going to be tolerable for the patient. And other opportunities are coming from the mentality of interdisciplinary oncology. Interdisciplinary oncology is to put the patient in the center and to put the uh, treatment systems uh, around the patient. And you have you can mix intelligent ways to use um, radiotherapy. This is a recurrent sarcoma patient um, after a previous irradiation. You can do um, uh, preoperative radiotherapy and be and being very protective of the uh, of the small bowel, and then you can resect and do intraoperative radiotherapy. That's a combination that can be uh, exploited um, for for uh, certain patients. This is an unresectable pancreatic cancer patient in which you do preoperative pre chemo radiation with protons. Again, quite a lot of protection of normal tissues. And because it is unresectable, then you can do a boost with intraoperative radiotherapy, again, removing normal tissues away from the, um, from the electron beam. And also in protons, we have uh, learned, and it's, it's, it's common practice, to use expanders, tissue expanders, to, um, to protect normal tissues. This is a typical example of, a, of an, a, 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 an expander in a, in a prostate case where the, where the, um, the, um, the rectal wall is, is move away from the area of high risk, uh, uh, high risk um, uh, toxicity from the, from the beams. Another uh, provocative um, um, feature that can be um, incorporated as an opportunity is the abscopal effect. This is an abscopal effect from uh, Google, easy to find, is made out of um, photons. But look at this ascopal effect, which is the first one that has been reported with protons. Here is a large sarcoma being treated when the patient is already metastatic. A long treatment, he, the, uh, the patient, uh, the metastatic disease grows. Uh, and even no, new areas appear. And five months after, uh, without any systemic therapy, there is a remission um, as brilliant as this one. Why I'm bringing you that? This, because this is a reality. Um, you know, we, we abscopal effect from radiation therapy is a biological uh, opportunity to be further explored and to be further explored with all the immunotherapy agents that we have in our hands. And again, the point of lymphocytes, lymphocytes, the less exposure of, of circulating blood to low doses or even bigger doses of radiation therapy is protecting the patient, is uh, allowing the patient to protect himself from, um, from um, uh, with his own um, immunity. Last paper uh, from our group published puts together data in a questionnaire uh, looking at the uh, delivery of protons in adult patients in Europe. We are institution number 15, and in institution number 15, in our questionnaire, we were able to report um, uh, proton therapy being delivered, being offered and delivered to patients with a variety of tumors. I think this is the way uh, this, this field is moving, um, uh, of course, in the States and probably in Europe, more and more, we are trying to bring protons and particle therapy to uh, patients that will have a clinical benefit. In total, this is a summary for you of our activity, more than 360 patients have been treated all of them in COVID pandemia, all of them in COVID pandemia. We started with COVID and we continue with COVID from many different countries, 
and with a, with a technology that has proven to be quite robust in, term, in terms of, uh, of functionality. It's all about people. The prac peak is protecting normal tissues. The normal tissues have to be estimated and understand much better. We don't understand well by NTCP um, uh, algorithms the reality of single patient, single tumor, single tissues, normal tissues. And this is my final slide uh, uh, to, to show to you that we are looking at the top of the iceberg. We are seeing just a portion of, we, of what we can do in medicine, in practice with particle therapy. The important thing is that we work, you physicists, you technologists, you uh, physicians, we have to work together. We have to create, to create an atmosphere of understanding, you know, if this is going to be using humans, well, let's now think how we would be better used uh, uh, to, um, in the near future uh, with, with projects that are really um, centered in, in medical practice, projects that are bringing this uh, technology to a, a daily practice uh, and not to a, 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 as a, as a, as a, a, an un, almost impossible to reach technology for many patients. Uh, I, I, I'm really very grateful for your attention, and I am open to, to questions. And I once again, I, I in my gratitude to, to the organizers, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Calvo, for actually guiding us and holding our hand through the current scenario of challenges, technologies, toxicity, which you, of course, would like to reduce, and this cost city, which I like very much, this balancing of the two. And in the end, I don't want to take too much of your time because I know you said that you had another commitment. So first, if, you, if I may, could we please turn on your camera so we can take our photo, Zoom photo, one of these days, it will be photo in person. Uh, Patty, are you ready to take a photo? Yes, yes. Could you please turn yeah, your camera? Yeah, just uh, if uh, Dr. Calvo can just stop share. Okay, yes, that. please. Yes. Share, okay. Yeah, I did the, that, didn't I? Uh, no. no, not yet. No. Not, because... yet. not yet. How about that? Mm, we still see the slides. <laughs> I cannot believe this. One moment, one moment. Please. Uh, uh, because we would like to see you. <laughs> that didn't work either? No. 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 <laughs> what about that? Still not. Oh, well, listen. Let's, let my, never my pet, can I, let's take a photo anyway. It won't be as, that's the way it is. But anyway, could we please turn on your video cameras and let's take a photograph and then yeah. for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. So now coming back to, as I said, a really a great presentation and laying out the challenges we have uh, in particle therapy and carbon therapy even more so. And so I open for questions. Um, just a few questions, because I know that Dr. Calvo has to leave very soon. Please, you can speak directly and ask your questions if you would like, or you can put them on the chat. Thank you, Professor Calvo. It was a really great presentation. I have a, a, a question for you. Uh, these patients, anyway, are uh, quite a rare disease. Uh, uh, the, in uh, the patient that we see also in Italy, they are quite uh, difficult to find, uh, to select. Uh, what's uh, your approach to the recruitment of patients in, in Spain? And which are your uh, advices on this, uh, on this topic? On, on practical terms, we accept um, uh, patients for uh, proton therapy that are um, sent to us from the different uh, public health care hospitals and so on with, the, with diseases in the list of the minister. 
that we see, we evaluate, and if the patient is a good candidate, we will uh, we will treat the patient um, um, without any restriction. The, uh, then in our own practice, we uh, offer the patient uh, proton therapy as an alternative to, to, to photon therapy if we see a major uh, difference in dosimetry, even if we, do, we are not sure that that dosimetric um, difference is going to be uh, an important clinical difference benefit. But even if, uh, in, in that case, we, we, we explain the patient that he has two alternatives and we try to make the point uh, of, of, of what is the expected clinical benefit that can be uh, uh, achieved by proton therapy. So important, uh, Sandro, we, we are offering proton therapy um, uh, openly to patients that we, we believe that they have a, 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 a difference in dosimetry, um, in, um, important enough to make a clinical um, uh, advice. Thank you. So, uh, so there's a question on chat saying, how many pediatric patients were treated during the COVID period? Yeah, at your good, center. Yeah, good, good question. It was in my slide. Uh, it, we treat uh, one third of our patients are pediatric patients, and uh, of them, of them, half of them need uh, anesthesia. Of them, all of them have to travel. It was it was a minority that they live in Madrid. Many of those kids are coming from uh, all over the places. So we have to train ourselves to care those patients very uh, especially. Yeah, the protons today is uh, nice, nice, nice. But in the case of pediatric case, uh, patients, you have to have an special expertise, and it's good that you have proton therapy units in hospitals inside hospitals, because that helps with the anesthesia, with the, uh, with the radiology, with nuclear medicine, with so many other um, services that you need to, um, to, to give to the patients to care them well. So I have a question because, you know, one of the things we've been struggling with, as you know, is this cost city, okay? And at the same time, as a, person who's treating patients, you of course want to have reduced toxicity and reduced cost overall. And your data clearly shows that if you do integrated analysis, actually the costs are not so different. So how do we overcome this apparent immediate reaction is that it's very expensive to do particle therapy? Well, we, we have to be, we have to be code unquote, very aggressive in showing the managers and the uh, health authorities that the cost of a cancer patient is, is an integral cost. <laughs> it has a cost on the delivery of treatments, it has a cost on the supportive care, and it has a cost long term in terms of dependence, social dependence. They have to go back to work. They have, they have to go back to, to life. So and these are costs that can be financially uh, analyzed and put together. This is important. Yeah. And then we are forgetting one cost, one cost that is very important, which is suffering, human suffering. So we are, you know, we are not uh, making dollars and euros yeah. about that. But it's a great cost. No, 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 I absolutely agree. And we, I think, you know, we've been looking at this and I remember Roberto Recchia doing some cost analysis more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And yet still there is this immediate reaction. So we obviously have to, as you say, do a collaborative effort to change that perspective somehow, because it still seems to be in the, the current thing is causticity. Um, there's another question on the chat. What can we do expand the list of clinical indications for particle therapy? And what model of patient selection would be the most appropriate? The, um, the, uh, the academic way to answer that is that we have to do studies. And we have to do studies methodologically um, influential. And uh, the temptation is yes, we have to do studies, randomized studies, or no. This is academic. We have to learn the lesson. 
we have to be able to build up prospective information, well analyzed, well, well registered, and with that, grow the arguments. If we wait for randomized data, first, we have to wait long term because local therapy requires a lot of time to get a feedback. And secondly, uh, there, is, there is no support, financial support for that type of research. So, you know, academically, you do methodological, uh, good methodological trials. No, we have to do it together by integrating expert groups with similar interests and try, try to expand the knowledge prospectively, nicely uh, register, and with points, objectives that are value, value, added value, health value, values that are uh, measurable. No, 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 we need a different uh, scenario. And I agree, and actually Kai Grau was on the list before, and, and this is the European Particle Therapy Network is actually going towards that of trying to work in an integrated way. And I think this is the only way we are going to make the next steps, as you are saying. So I absolutely agree. And I know that you, are in a, you have an, another appointment. So I would like to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and really leading us by the hand that the advantages, but already the current challenges that we are facing. So thank you again and see you in Pavia. Thank you all. Thank you all very much for your patience. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.